Looked like the smoke cleared out nicely. Uh, next up, we have Alex Stokes, Ethereum meets Filecoin. Take it away. Hey, everyone. Uh, I have some slides, and there they are. So let me turn this into a slideshow. OK. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm Alex Stokes. Uh, I'm a researcher at the Ethereum Foundation, uh, spending a lot of time thinking about Ethereum, how we can scale it, make the protocol more secure, more sustainable, all these things. Uh, if any of you are following, we had uh, the first merge of our testnet, Robston, this morning that went pretty well. So that was, yeah, that was very exciting. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, uh, this talk will not be about that. Uh, this is about something different, and it comes down to the history of the network and like what we do with it. Um, and as we'll see, Filecoin might be like a very nice sort of uh, substrate for this history. I'll explain to you uh, what that is. And um, yeah, so I kind of uh, thought there might be some interesting like interoperability opportunities here, and that's what we'll kind of dig into today. Uh, so first off, yeah, like what's history? It's probably what you think, but basically when you run a blockchain node today, right, you essentially like start from Genesis and you sync the whole chain. Uh, and then especially in blockchains like Ethereum and then also Filecoin, right, there's a bunch of other stuff that happens when you have this data you download. So not only do you have like the actual blocks and the transactions, but there's like uh, sort of, you know, outputs or effects of the execution of the state, right? So there's the state of the blockchain, there's like receipts, which are like results of execution, all this stuff. Um, and right now, like the way most people build blockchain clients is it keeps everything forever. And uh, that's handy, right? Like we have this like guarantee of like being able to verify the whole chain, which we'll get to a bit later is like still critical to maintain if you, even if you don't have this history. But, you know, for the most part, most people don't really care. <laughs> you know, once history is past a certain age. Uh, I have this like cute little picture here. You guys probably know Etherscan. And this is the, uh, the first ever Ethereum transaction that we could find. Uh, and the reason why is because basically there's like a minimum gas uh, that a transaction is on Ethereum. And before this, the block gas limit was not high enough to actually do anything. So this was, uh, yeah, block 46,147. Uh, so that's kind of funny. I think they sent like uh, 3117 gig away or something. Anyway. Um, yeah, and that's the thing, right, where it's like, okay, you care a lot about like, you know, the DEX trade you just made or like the Filecoin deal you just closed. But like not so much about the ones that you did five years ago. And, you know, and a little bit what this means is like this, this, like this process where you keep all the history, it just doesn't scale. You know, it implies this linear cost and storage, bandwidth, processing, just this overhead you always have to like carry uh, for all time. So the question is like, you know, if we want to make more sustainable blockchains and, you know, the client software that runs them, like how do we do this? So uh, I've been working along with some others on this EIP called EIP 44s. That is the canonical pronunciation. And uh, yeah, essentially what we want to do is say, okay, if you run an execution client on the network, it only keeps like the last so many you know epochs of history. For example, one year. Uh, so just like quickly a summary of this EIP. It changes its guarantee. Whereas I said before, right now when you like run Geth or something, like you have all the history forever. Instead, you just have like again, say like the last year, just a part of it. Uh, and this would include everything, you know, the blocks I mentioned. There's headers, transactions, omers, which are like these uncle blocks. The receipts I mentioned. So there's all this stuff where it's like you need it to verify the state moving forward. But once you do it, you can almost like I mean delete it, which is what the CIP essentially proposes, because you don't need it. Like once you've checked it once, you're kind of done for all time. And from there, it's just like, unless you have some archival use case, it's just sitting on your hard disk forever. So this is what the IP tries to do, is say, OK, do we really need to keep that? So importantly, this doesn't touch the execution state. I think I have, I'll just skip ahead. There's this whole slide here. There's this very separate, very deep research topic on state expiry, uh, which is saying, OK, uh, we have like an Ethereum state and, you know, Filecoin, I'm sure we'll get here in the same, you know, get to a similar point soon where essentially, you know, you have this massive state and the question's like, yeah, that, like that's not sustainable either. Uh, this EIP is not about state expiry, just the history. So there's like a kind of subtle distinction there, but it's important, you know, when we're talking about this stuff. Um, yeah, again, this is not a state expiry, so I'm going to stop talking about it. Uh, concretely, like, yeah, how, so yeah, maybe hopefully you're convinced that there's a problem with, like, keeping all this history. The CIP that I'm throwing in front of you says, okay, we'll just get rid of it. Well, how do we do that? And 
all the EIP really does is say, okay, we're going to change. Because right now there's this guarantee at the networking layer that as a peer, I can request any of this data from you from all time. Uh, so the EIP says we're going to just change that. For whatever this like history period is, again, say a year. Uh, if you're beyond that, then like I don't have to answer. You say, hey, give me that first block, you know, that very first transaction in that block. Uh, and you just say, yeah, I don't have it, sorry. The cool bit is that now, because you don't need to serve these queries, your local node can like drop all the history. Uh, and that's how you get these like scalability benefits in terms of operating nodes. So just to give you like a flavor of what we're talking about here, like I tried to motivate there's a problem and like yeah, some simple solution to, to solve the problem. Uh, but like maybe you're like, okay, I'm not convinced because like maybe this isn't a huge deal. Maybe it's not a huge deal today. What does that look like? And you know, part of this is like everyone uses Ethereum and they're like, okay, it's like so expensive. Why is it so expensive? Well, uh, a number of reasons, but essentially it comes down to like part of the cost there is that it comes down to having to keep this data and like process this data like I alluded to a second ago. Uh, again, just looking at Geth, I'm sure if you guys know Ethereum, it's a client you're familiar with. They have this handy command, DB inspect, uh, and it basically breaks down like, okay, you know, for the, all of the like headers of the chain, it's 50 megabytes. And this was like, I did this maybe like late March, early April of this year, so pretty recent. Um, and so you know, these numbers have grown some, but not too much. And anyway, the point, you know, the point being for the history here is there's this like they batch this out as like this ancient store, and you can see there's like you know, around, you know, if there's 500 gigabytes of storage, there's around 250 or so, you know, actually more like 300. Anyways, there's a bunch, there's a bunch that's just like ancient data, and it's, it's a lot of the stuff that we could almost certainly drop under something like four fours. So why do we care? Um, I've kind of been driving to this, but basically the reason we care is because it makes it more sustainable in the long run to run a node. Like, the vision here is that like literally every single one of you is like running a Geth node at home, and if we say, hey, uh, in like five years, you can do this, but you're gonna need like a very sophisticated one or two terabyte like hard disk, like that's uh, going to make it less likely you'll do this, right? So it's better for the health of the network if we can make it as easy as possible. And the reason we want more people to do this is because it actually strengthens the guarantees the network provides, right? Like blockchains are blockchains because every last one of you is like checking the rules for yourself. If you don't do that, then like you can just use things we already have and we don't care about blockchains then. So, you know, zooming out a little bit, like this is a question about guarantees the protocol provides. Uh, by the way, like Filecoin will have the same issue at some point. <laughs> uh, and so it's like really asking ourselves like, yeah, what, what does it mean to run a node? Like, what do we, what do we really want to accomplish when we do this? Uh, there's not like some deep technical challenge. Like I literally just told you the solution was like, you know, we're just gonna delete everything older than a year. Like it's literally already like pulled out separately in the implementation. Like it, these things aren't like really that hard to do, but it's just a question of like doing them in a way that like preserves the values and again guarantees the protocol gives. So that's where it can get tricky. And yeah, I mean, just to give my take on that question, right? Like what should the protocol do? Like at least with Ethereum, I think it should be this like very, uh, very sort of optimized uh, layer for consensus. And what that means is that you kind of only need like the recent state, the recent history to like validate the current consensus, and then otherwise, uh, you know, you, you don't need it. Uh, in particular, like if we run like the stock Ethereum protocol, it's not an archival service. You can run it in that way. There are clients who offer that for you, but it's a burden, right? It's this like linear burden that only gets bigger over time. Uh, to have, to sort of require everyone who wants to run the protocol to also be like an archive node, or at least like have the option to do so, right? So hopefully things is cool, and this is now where we'll like start to make ties to Filecoin and things, because we have less history, and there's immediately some questions. Like, okay, we're gonna drop the history, but again, it's very important to like the, the values of Ethereum and I think crypto more broadly that like the, the history is still available. We should be, still be able to get the history. We should still be able to like validate that there's like a, you know, a chain that made sense and is one that we agree to. Um, so how are we gonna do that? And yeah, this is what I just said. Uh, it's like very critical to Ethereum's values that like the history is still there. So someone needs to give it to you. Like let's say we're in this 4.4's world and you like wanna again verify the very first transaction. Like you need to get it from somewhere. The thing is though for this, you just need like, you know, if, if you had a guarantee there was literally one person who would like give you this, then you're good, right? You just need like a few reliable actors that exist. 
uh, to, to give you the history. And then it's not that you need this like whole decentralized network to do this necessarily, because Filecoin might help here. Um, and yeah, obviously there's like censorship risk there because the, the concern is, okay, let's say we do move in this world and there are just like a few actors. Uh, and then what if they're now extorting you to like get the history or something like this? Like that's not good. And like in terms of like the, the technical, the engineering of it, this is like an archival use case, meaning like you kind of like write it once and it's just sitting somewhere forever so you can like optimize for that, so that's nice. And yeah, I have this list here of like example providers. So for example, you could say, okay, people like the EF, uh, like I've talked a bit with the Filecoin Foundation about this EIP so far, part of like why I'm here. Uh, so the Filecoin Foundation, you could have different players in the crypto space who like want to host this almost as like a public good, right? Uh, the Portal Network is like an initiative we have within Ethereum to like have sort of like a decentralized archive node, a whole different conversation. Uh, something outside of crypto, you might have heard of the Internet Archive. They basically try to like, ar like literally archive every web page ever. <laughs> uh, and so you can imagine they might want to help. And then yeah, individu individuals like you and me who are like hosting torrents or you know file mirrors of this stuff, um, stuff like this, Etherscan and Fira, uh, what there's like Phil Scan or something. There, there are different players who like already provide this sort of data service, and you can imagine they want to support uh, with this history in the same way. And a kind of cool thing that I've been toying with is like even some sort of public good DAO. So you can imagine, not only do you have these more like traditional actors, like this not these nonprofits in the world that like sit and do this, you could have a DAO on chain that's somehow either like funding the history preservation process or something more exotic. So lots of options. Uh, how will we get it? And this is a bit of an implementation detail, right? So the first step was like, who's gonna provide it? They have to provide it in a particular way, because ideally you'd want it to be like automated. It's not that you wanna like drive to like, you know, <laughs> the Fed building and like download a, you know, pick up a hard disk or something. So how we actually get it, um, there's a couple different ways. Again, like IPFS could be cool, because you can just imagine the history is out there. Filecoin then comes in and says, okay, Somehow we've incentivized now this like layer on top to, to keep the IPFS data around. Uh, there's like cool things we can do around how we actually structure the data because you could imagine like putting it in a format that's amenable to proofs. So you could say, okay, uh, give me like the third block in the chain ever, but also give me a proof. So I don't have to like download all this history. If I have some commitment I trust in some other way, then I could like get a succinct proof that this block exists uh, and that'd be pretty cool. So I called out this link. Uh, we have someone doing some concrete prototyping for the CIP, uh, Henry DF is the handle. Uh, check that out, I'll say a bit more about that at the end of the talk. And yeah, so you know, I'll just take a few seconds to talk about Filecoin. Um, you know, how, how exactly would it, would it help out here? And there's a couple ways to think about it. Cause like at, at one level, right, Filecoin literally just kind of be this like hard disk, right? Just abstraction of a hard disk that we write to. Uh, where, you know, I, for example, I go and I like take the history myself and I write it to Filecoin. I could like get a deal for the storage and all that. There could be some way to retrieve it, right? So that's stage one. Uh, stage two is like a, a tighter integration. And this is where I think you could see a lot of like cool like interop between the two protocols. So especially if we had like bridges between say Filecoin and Ethereum, then again, you can imagine things like these public goods styles I was talking about a second ago where you know, the DAO could even like buy storage contracts through like the FVM that we just saw about, right? And then like do that in this like very cool decentralized trustless way. Um, who knows if we'll get there, but uh, it's at least a very cool sort of uh, thought experiment, I think. And then yeah, you could, there's a ton you could do, right? Cause then it's like, okay, like are people actually like running the Filecoin protocol with respect to our history? I believe we'd be able to like subset verify of these proofs that like that's happening. Anyway, a lot of cool stuff you could do. Uh, yeah, and then just the latest work. Uh, if you're interested in Ethereum or this work at all, like reach out to me on Telegram. The handle's RLX Stokes, and also Henry DF, and I mentioned his work there. He's been doing some prototyping uh, of how this might actually work out in practice. And I think that was it. I'm not quite sure how I'm doing on time. Uh, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'd love to take them. Otherwise, I'll be around for a bit after.